What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the No Starving Artist podcast. I'm really, really, really excited for this episode. I feel like we've been uh, on a little streak from the beginning. I've been blessed to have some amazing guests so far, and today is no different. Um, we have the amazing Francisco Gela on the podcast today. Um, he is an educator. He is a an artist. Um, he was at one point a gymnast, a, a com- company director. Uh, So I'm going to give him a chance to introduce himself, kind of where he's at right now, and then we're going to dive a little bit deeper into his story and and, uh, what he's currently getting into. So everybody say hello, and Francisco, Uh, go ahead and tell them kind of where you're at right now. Yes, I'm Francisco Gela, um, and I'm so honored to be here. Thank you for inviting me, Jason. Uh, I currently live in Santa Fe, New Mexico. I have, so there's three major things, or many major things that are happening right now. Uh, I am the chief creative officer of Francisco Gala Dance Works, and we host events all over the country, intensives, um, anywhere from technique to choreography to um, understanding college applications and, 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 and of sorts. Uh, I am the co artistic director of Zeitgeist Dance Theater, which is a company that we started here in Santa Fe with my director, Usha Marie Shrizano. We just had our fourth summer season here, so it was amazing. I also am ballet and modern faculty for 24-7 dance convention, and I'm also a freelance choreographer, and I don't necessarily choreograph uh, on the commercial end of things. I do stuff for ballet companies and modern companies uh, all over the country, in Canada, and in Central America, so that's where I'm at right now. Lots of things going on. Amazing, amazing. I have uh, a lot of questions for you, uh, okay. but I wanted to start uh, first off with a little uh, a tiny story because I actually, I took your class once upon a time here in Utah, um, <laughs> a, a long time ago at a small, small convention here. Okay. And, um, and ever since then, I've kind of always just like kept in uh, tune with what it is that you're doing. I, I would yeah. see you, I feel like one time you were posting a lot of stuff on Facebook and mm-hmm. then... So it's just, it's really, really an honor to just kind of be here and having this conversation with you. So thank you again. Um, so I'm interested in a couple things. One is, and maybe this will end up being a long winded answer. We'll see. But so did you always, was choreography and creating always mm-hmm. kind of your, your focus or did you, did you do the whole dancer life at one point? Okay, so I didn't start dancing until I was 19. I actually went to the University of Washington and I got a full academic scholarship and my intention was to become an aerospace engineer because in Seattle, you know, Boeing is there. What do you do? You build planes. And so when I got there, I was disappointed that I did did not have the head or the skills to continue with the math part of it. And Mm. so I was really, really disappointed in myself. And, you know, so I decided rather than punishing myself for it and jumping to something else. I said, you know what? I'm going to take this spring semester of my freshman year to go take a dance class and take a, I'm not one-on-one class. Well, I took the dance class and ever since then it's been, <laughs> so yeah, wow. I mean, the intention for me was to train. I had so much catching up to do. The gymnastics obviously helped. I was a gymnast yeah. for eight years. And so the transition was really easy for me. Um, well, not easy, easy on the physical scale, but when it came to ballet, I mean, my legs were so muscular that it was so difficult to turn out, but right. that, that developed over time. Um, and then when the, for, after two years of, of training in the dance program, which is not very well known, you know, I just took what I could, um, cause I didn't yeah. have any family support. And especially when I decided to become a dancer, like my, my parents were just like, what are you doing? And we didn't speak for a while. <laughs> and, um, you know, so I just basically took it upon myself to continue to, tra- to, to train and do whatever I need to do to catch up. And two years after I started training, my first ever um, job was with the Seattle Opera. And I was surprised mm. that I ended up getting a job. So I ended up training for a long time. And then uh, four years after um, training at the University of Washington, I ended up auditioning for Paul Taylor in New York, got into second company, but I had no financial support or family support, so I couldn't afford to live there. I actually ended up mm. dancing I met somebody there and ended up dancing for repertory dance theater for two years in Salt Lake City. So I ah, ended up okay. for the okay. modern company and that's how it started. And I went from there okay. to the Philadelphia Dance Company in, in Philadelphia for about four or five seasons. And then from there, I went, to, I went from two modern companies to dance for a contemporary ballet company called Ballet Pacifica in Irvine. And I did mm-hmm. that for four years before and guested with California Ballet and National Career Representative. And then 
decided that I wanted to teach. And yeah. I wasn't only teaching for the school at the time, but I ended up teaching for a competitive studio because some of the ballet company members were like, hey, we need another ballet teacher. Would you like, would you like to come and teach? Yeah. And that studio was Dance Precisions. And that was in uh, in Orange mm. County, California, the Powerhouse Studio, all the big names, like Molly Long is my student. She's from there. Yep. From Project 21. Yep. Ashley Gonzalez is another student. She's currently teaching for Velocity. Paula Van Oppen, Carrington Payne, um, uh, uh, so many of those students, Nathan Tresaurus, like all those students I taught and also taught yeah. Russia. So basically for me, like as a dancer, did I ever knew that I was going to teach? I knew that I had a proclivity for it. And when I toured with Philadelphia up dance company, I mean, I got to teach the master classes at like Harvard and Duke University whenever we, 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 um, we toured, but at that point, I was still catching up with my ballet while I was dancing for the company. So I just focused on yeah. training and really immersing myself in the company experience. And it wasn't until around 2006, seven or eight that I really, really got into teaching. And it became a yeah. thing where, I don't know, actually before that, 2004, that I became really aware that I wanted to teach. And then the whole teaching thing just evolved. You know, I started my own school. Yeah. I closed it after six years because that's in a whole other situation together and discussion. I could, <laughs> I could not handle the parents. Um, and, I, uh, and I was at a point where I wanted to, con to combine the commercial aspect and the concert dance aspect together. Mm -hmm. And that was way before how it is now, you know, like where at Break the Floor we have assistance from Julia. That would have never happened, yeah. you know, yeah. 20 years ago. So it was really, really, um, you know, a challenge. So, but that's a whole different yeah. question. And then from there, you know, I ended up, um, you know, the, the school actually ended up putting myself out there. And then, you know, I got an email from Gil Stroming that, you know, hey, do you want to be part of this convention? I'm like, who's Gil Stroming? I had no idea who he was. <laughs> And then I saw that he was the owner of like Nubo and Jump. He's like, you got to come to Ogden, which by the way, there's so many connections to Utah because my audition for the 24th yeah. Ballet Company, like for a uh, convention was in Utah and Ogden. And I was at Jump. Okay. And okay. so, you know, a month later after I did that in 2000 and I don't remember, it was 11 or 12. It was, it was 2012. Because this year is my, my 10th season of the company. Um, yeah. Ended up getting a job and... That's it, pretty much. So yeah, I mean, a little bit That's of a incredible. long, winded kind of like of how I got here. But there's something yeah, happened. yeah. You know, I didn't have like I always felt like an outsider because I didn't grow up competing. So all of my faculty that they all know each other because that when right, you right. mention things. So for me, it's like who the hell is this guy? And yeah, I came in yeah. with a set of principles that I felt were really were really important. I wanted to teach ballet um, and and make it inclusive. And it didn't, it didn't really matter what body type you were. For me, it was about teaching the disciplinary aspects of it, about having to fight for certain, th certain things that didn't work for you. Like, Bally taught me all those lessons, so I wanted to teach those lessons um, for them. I'm so sorry that this sounds... <laughs> no, you're you're totally fine. Don't apologize. Yeah, yeah that's incredible. So do, so do you think, do you feel like you had, like, a, a an underlying motivation or driver that was kind of taking you through all of those moments yes. up until now? Yeah. Or do you think it was just, kind of, was it just you were on for the ride? No. So I always, when I saw that concert that made me want to become a dancer, when I took that dance class, yeah. I knew I had to do it. And part mm. of the reason why I think the success was so fast was I used my gymnastics discipline. And right, you know, like, right. like, like going to the gym early in the morning at four thirty, then staying at, you know, going to school and staying until eight or nine at night, and having to do homework. I just used the yeah. same exact training principles that I was taught to me as a gymnast and committed to it, and transferred those learning and commitment and dedicated, dedicated, uh, dedicated skills into my dance training. And as soon as I knew I wanted to do it, I mean, at one point I was dancing seven days a week for like eight months straight because I, I was like, I love it so much, but I also felt I was so yeah. behind. And I got to a point where I got sick because I didn't have, I was like running myself to the ground and I was like, no, yeah. I want to do more. So yeah, the internal, like when I found dance, I found my passion, but I also found my purpose in life basically. Yeah. Because it's not, yeah. not yeah. translated to dancing for companies, it's not translated to teaching and mentoring and being a business owner. And right, using right. that passion to be able to translate all of that has been a struggle because, you know, like I always felt like an outsider. I didn't even really know, you know, um, anybody in the dance world, like, you yeah. know, the ballet world thought I was in the right 
the right body type and but I could do all this stuff and I could be I had clean lines and the conventional world mm-hmm. they didn't know who I was and didn't understand how I made people love ballet so I was getting on all sides and like I think for me the yeah. thing that kept me together was my absolute love for it and that kept me yeah. you yeah. know through the judgment through all the craziness through all you know, people criticizing me and telling me that, you know, in the ballet world that, oh, you're a sellout because you're doing convention. And I'm like, yeah, well, some of the ballet mm. world people, some of them are not teaching for conventions. But, like, yeah. but way back yeah. then, I was, I was, you know, getting so much flack. But it was the belief and the love for the art form and, and seeing the difference I was making with students yeah. and also just the love of the process that really kept me going. Interesting, interesting. Yeah, I can imagine to, just to kind of run back because this has been a little bit of a through point. I can imagine that the the understanding of like your actual mechanics coming yeah. from gymnastics yeah. to to dance was definitely because I I feel like I see that missing with a lot of dancers yeah. is they have they have the other side of it but they don't necessarily understand the actual well, mechanics behind the what physicality doing. of it. Like you know when I was swimming for yeah. for I mean for me it wasn't about getting strong. I was there for me. The issue was lengthening. And allowing my, my, my mm. muscles to work not in a an explosive manner, but a more lengthened, yeah. lyrical manner, more lengthened. So for right. me, it was like I had to go back and take with the six year olds. You know, while I was, <laughs> you know, they were like their pink. I didn't care because I wanted to see what it was about. I didn't understand that I had to point my feet. And you know, yeah. in gymnastics, they don't care about your feet. They care about your shoulder angle. They care about the strength of your core. Yeah, I just had to really find ways to not be stiff and to lengthen my spine to be able to move it. I mean, I remember in my first year of dancing, my teacher was like making fun of me because my shoulders were humongous. And it was like, me, Cleaver, you know, yeah. whatever. Yeah. And then yeah. I think it was just a matter of translating that instead of holding a position to move through it, to understand how to lengthen right. it, that there are fast twitch muscles that we gymnasts don't necessarily use from a rotational capacity. But as soon yeah. as I understood yeah. that physicality, I transferred all of that information. I said, okay, this is it, but it's turned out. The mm. flexibility was there, but I need to rotate from my hip as opposed to, you know, kidding at perfect six o'clock when my leg was parallel when I turned in. I turned yeah. in. So it was yeah. just a matter of really like, um, you know, taking the physical aspects. Like, but for me, like, I wasn't afraid to attack. I wasn't afraid to jump. I wasn't afraid to go for a fall. Mm. And if I fell, I, mm. I would. Hurt, you know, not hurt myself because as a gymnast, how many times have you fallen? I've fallen worse, you know, you know, yeah. on my neck or my shoulder or whatever from a release move or from a, doing a double back into a pit and then just hitting yourself. I mean, there was all kinds of things. And I felt like dance was super fun because it was a different moving capacity. But the yeah. difference there yeah. is that there was an art form aspect of it that wasn't mm-hmm. present in gymnastics. And I mean, gymnastics is a physical art form, but dance is physical, but there's an emotional and spiritual connection that is right. part of it that is that is not inherent in in, a, in that sport. So, you know, right, right. you know, I want to um, if, if you're OK, I'd love to jump back to a point because I, I think it's uh, I think it would be really, really interesting for uh, some of the younger dancers that are listening that might be fearing something similar. So you mentioned when you decided to pivot from. Uh, let's say the traditional route into dance. It was something that your parents weren't necessarily super into. Yeah. Um, how did you kind of navigate in, in as much detail as you're comfortable with? How did you kind of navigate um, just that process of, of continuing on, even though there were people that weren't nece- people close to you that weren't necessarily super into it? You know, I had to distance myself, but and I'm going to say this because I was able to do it because I was in college, right? It's different when you're a child, yeah. when yes. you're still living with Correct. your parents. So for me, I had the Correct. privilege and a almost a fortunate situation where I said, okay, well, if you don't want to support me, fine, I'm going to do this on my own. But mm. I, I got it on all fronts. You know, like even when I was training, oh, it's too late for you. Uh, you're not the right body mm. type. Uh, you know, you'll never uh, make anything of yourself because, you know, like it's too late for you. And I'm like, are you sure about that? Yeah. And I think for me, what drove me was just the passion. And then when teachers yeah. took me under their wing, I knew, okay, they're making time for me. So they must see something in me. There's something, and there's here, something yeah. here. And and I was given scholarships wherever I would take a, at a studio somewhere because that's where I can, you know, I never, I never was able to afford to go anywhere. I mean, I went and auditioned two years after I started dancing. I went to audition for the Ailey School. I got accepted. 
And I was yeah. supposed to go, and then my, my parents backed out at one point because they said they were going to support me. And then when they found out that it was for something like that, they were like, we're not going to support you. So <laughs> fine. I got into American Dance Festival. I got to all these festivals. But I think for me, not knowing that I could afford those things, of course, was hurtful because I didn't get any support. But knowing that I was accepted, for most mm-hmm. of them, felt like, oh, okay. So this group is saying that I could do this. This group. And then, you know, two years after you know, training, I auditioned for Seattle Opera and I ended up getting a contract for 10 weeks. And back then it paid $750 a week. That's a lot back in 1994. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it was really, really like, as soon as I knew that people understood that I had this talent, they started seeing me in auditions. I'm like, okay, there's a future here. But it still didn't hurt the fact, but by the fact that, oh, I mean, you know, I had choreographers come in, oh, they called me big leg man, or um, Mm. you're not tall enough or you're not the right color, mm. you're not the right race, um, or mm. there's not enough of you, so you might as well just give up. Um, and for me, it was so much, because I love it so much that I focused and reverted all that rejection and hurt into my training. And it wasn't even that I was trying to prove mm. anything. I was like, you know what? As I was going out in auditions, I was seeing people that were better than, that were better than me and I would go further in the cuts than they would. Mm. There, there was something about it but I felt also that the feeling and the artistry just was so natural like it made me feel a certain way that yeah. I just kept going so for me it, it's just the love for it if there is rejection and people are making fun of you I go back and, and revert that energy into my training and to remind me mm. why I'm doing it and then and then uh, I would hang out with people that believed in me that would tell me we can yeah. do this so I surrounded myself yeah. with people that understood what my challenges were, but also understood what were my gifts. And then they would mm-hmm. tell me, you need to work on this because this can hold you back. Or this is really good, Francisco. You have this, you have a jump. You're not afraid to partner. You, you're physical. Mm-hmm. You're not afraid to go down on the floor. You can, you, there's all these athletic gifts that you have. That is something you need to work on. They would tell me, but then on the other side of it, it can always be athletic. You also have to have a streamlined um, uh, body line and, and musical sensibility, you know. Um, so yeah. there was all these things that um, the people that believed in me that helped me get through all that. But I think right, right. the internal strength and the love for it just kept me going. Like there was nothing that was yeah. going to stop me from doing what I need to do. So. Yeah. Which I actually, this is, this is, I, I love this so much because I feel like now I'm, I'm understanding more um, your your driver behind mm. dance works. Yeah. Um, because when I was kind of looking through all of this, it, it's very, uh, I think, I think the headline on the, on the website is holistic yeah. dance training. And then you kind of break down all these things. And now it's making more sense. Why? Like I can see the passion that you have for right. not just the dance itself, right. but like how you were able to get here. So I'd love to kind of get into now um, just that aspect of things. How did you, Because like one thing I struggle with is like translating ideas or things that I have happened to me into actual structure. And from from looking at your your system and um, the years that you've been doing it, how did you go from okay? I know how I got here. I know that mindset is important. I know that it's just as important as the other things. But now, how do I actually structure something that works and that can help people on scale? Well. So the holistic dance training part of it and the soul part of it really comes from a very deeply personal situation. So I'm going to get personal mm. here. I, w- I was physically abused by my parents when I was younger. And, you know, there were many times in my life where I just wanted to give up. But gymnastics was a harbinger and a safe space for me. So that helped me get through all that. But I also promised yeah. myself that I would never, ever treat another human being the way I was treated as a kid. Okay. So the holistic part of the whole thing is that the emotional part of it was to make sure that I would mentor and empower and believe in kids, even if they didn't feel like they were the right body type or didn't belong, because I understood how that felt for myself. But yet I am here. Mm. And so the tools that I use for myself, I helped um, uh, overcome those obstacles. This idea, all the training methods that I use, I'm using that I've developed over the last decade came from the school that failed. Let me explain. Mm -hmm. The school itself became a laboratory for my teaching. 
And so I would use, you know, and then there were things that were successful. And then I became this thing yeah. where I, I took concepts in gymnastics to help with flexibility and strength and then just applied it to dance. And so I was cross training my, my dancers and I really used that six years. So although the school failed because it closed only after six years, it actually was the, the connector to everything because that six years helped me develop my voice as an instructor and as a mentor and as an educator. Right. It made me look at my right. own methods, um, like you know what was working or wasn't working. But the great thing about it is that because it was under the safe space, you know, like I was able to play around, and the parents didn't really were not educated enough to know what I was doing, so they just believed in what I was doing. So let me just sort of yeah. explain that the success of the school actually led to its demise. Why? Because mm -hmm. I trained these kids. These kids came from B and C companies or studios, and then two years later, they were beating the A kids in the other studios, the 18 kids in the other studios, the 18 kids in the other studios they came yeah. from. And then the parents just felt like they were better at managing their kids' lives. So, but I'm like, mm -hmm. I have to remind them if it wasn't for, for the training that we provided and the faculty and, and our curriculum right. that they wouldn't be there. So for me, you know, it's taking an idea, like, you know, for instance, like a plie, okay? Well, you know, people just think of a plie as the beginning of a ballet class. Well, guess what? It's the most important right. step of the entire vocabulary. You cannot jump without a plie or land without mm. a plie. So for me, understanding mm. the importance of the plie and understanding what that is, is really, really significant. It's function. So a grand, people just use it, oh, we're going to bend our legs and we're going to move forward. No, it's more than that. It is the first thing that you do in a rotational capacity. So different versions of it. Right. You pulse into it, different speeds into it. Um, holding positions underneath the grand plie. Like there's so many different ways to interpret a plie to where you can access the athletic part of it, but, but not negate the art form and its structure and its foundation. So for me, like I always start with what I call a leg activator where they're in the second position and they go down for like eight counts and they pulse for eight. Mm. They hold for eight and straighten. Yeah. Because then what I found through my teaching is that if you place the body in that manner where they activate a certain part of their legs, the body will continue to work from that place the entire time. Mm -hmm. And so rather than, rather than having to hammer it and explain to the kids, it is now my job to make them feel that rather than explaining them anatomically because they don't really know anatomy. So if I make them feel it, then, mm. and show to them, so that means I have to think outside of the box. If this particular aspect of training that was taught to me is not effective, then I said, how can I do this better? And I research hmm. and talk to people, and whether it's, it's with physical therapists, which I talk to all the time, I have one that I work with all the time, and, and sometimes I'll yeah. say, well, do you think I should do this? And he'll say, no, no, that's not... <laughs> So that, personal <laughs> trainers, biomechanics, experts in, in, in other athletic fields, I talk to them about these training methods and I do my research or do what I feel like is necessary for me to be able to not reinvent, but make it more functional for the student so that they can yeah. actually, you know, um, be successful. So I had a kid one time who, who said, I just, you know, can't jump high. I said, well, do you understand how a jump functions? And she didn't understand that she had to use her feet, that, th that this mm. movement is part of it. She didn't understand that you have right. to train, that you have to hold your plie, that you have to jump as high as you can and hold your plie for eight counts. And that, that resistance, that, that dynamic stability and dynamic um, uh, execution and, and, and feeling in your body is what develops the, the height and the jump. And she, and, and she was just told, just go over this thing, jump as high as you can, jump over this hoop, jump over this mat. Yes, that kind of works, but if the muscles are in condition to do it correctly, it's not going to yeah. matter. You're just, you're just building bad muscle memory habits. So, so for me, there is definitely a biomechanical like aspect to the training that coincides with the artistic yeah. part of it. And I mean, honestly, Jason, like, does everything that, you, that your teacher ever taught, does it work? No, exactly. No. So for no. me, it's like, yeah, so, so we just, we just, take it and we give it to our student thinking yeah. that we're passing it on. No, if it's not effective, if it's not working, then we have to question its validity. Even if my favorite teacher yeah. taught me the exercise, I'm like, I don't care if it's not working for my kids or for my dancers or for anybody that I currently work with, it doesn't matter. The effectiveness for yeah. me has to be 
So then I revisit it and I question, what can I do to make this better? And oftentimes it's slowing it down right. and reassessing what that exercise could be to make it more effective for them. So I, 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 there are some things that I've been told that work, but the majority of it doesn't work. And also part of it too, it's yeah. cultural, it's generational. Because you know, the old school, you better do it, right? Here, you can't do it for these kids now. They have to understand, and it has to be of, their, of interest for them to be able to do what is it you're asking them to do, otherwise they don't care. I actually was, that was, I was actually just going to ask you that if you've experienced that, because I've experienced that pit, that generational shift quite Absolutely. a bit where to your point, 10, you know, 10 years ago when I started teaching just fresh, it was very much so I need you to do this. Okay, great. Now I feel like the, like you, to your point, exactly. The kids, they want, they need to understand it before they're even exactly. going to entertain the idea. They want to know the purpose. Are you, so I'm sorry, sorry, I interrupted, right. but you had a question. No, no, no. I, w I was going to say, are, how quickly are you seeing like uh, the improvement when you work with dancers? Is, is it something that you're notice are, that they're noticing very quickly, and then they're latching onto it even more because they're like, okay, I get it now? Or is it something that takes a little bit of time? I think that it's the way you present the information that's really key to this. If a dancers are told mm. to do this and they don't understand why they're doing it, they're not. If they, if they yeah. don't understand how the exercise is going to function for them later then they have no idea and no clue and they're not going to care to do it. But if there's a way for them mm -hmm. to allow um, for that, for the, for the dancers to feel which muscles are being used. And then if they understand how to get from point A to point B, you know, right? like for instance, like mm -hmm. they always complain why you have to do these long plies. And then, and then when they see later in class that when they're tired, they're able to jump higher. They're like, you know, that thing that we talked, that we complained about. <laughs> yeah. You're able to do this because of that or your legs higher because of that. Yeah. So I think I think showing yeah. them the efficacy of it is really important. And also mm -hmm. the other thing too mm -hmm. is like, I also also tell them, I have done this many times. I've been doing this and maybe I, I just turned 50. So I'm like, I've been doing this for 30 years. I know what I'm talking about. You can choose to be living or not. But most, most, most often yeah. I have done this enough to know that if you're going to do this, you're going to end up hurting yourself. But it's more than that. Right. It's really about, you know, like if you're going to be better, you have to trust your mentors. You are allowed to ask questions and you're allowed to both, you know, like sometimes kids will tell me certain things. And I'm like, oh, and I'll say to them, thank you for telling me that actually. Now I'm looking at yeah. differently. So yeah. it's collaborative, but I still have to lead the collaboration. You know what I mean? I also mm. still, I don't want to say force, but allow them to see my perspective because if they don't, then I'm not really doing my job as a mentor, right? So it's, it's right. understanding the function of the exercise, why you have to do it. But also, I always go back to this self-respect part and this fear part. If it's mm. something new and you know that you're not able to accomplish it or whatever, you need to welcome that. Fear of the unknown means it's new. Mm. If it's new, that, that equates to growth. If you're always doing something that you're already good at, then there's no growth because you're going to just do such a thing. So if I introduce something new to you and you're not good at it, I tell them it's okay. Please mess up. Mm -hmm. Please don't know what you're doing. Please ask questions because if you don't know, there is an opportunity for you to see this whole thing in a different light. Seeing something different right. and doing something you've never done before and you're bad at it and make mistakes means it's a it's high time for you to grow. So welcoming that environment where, hey, I'm expecting for you to be perfect because the kids want to be perfect, right? They want to get it right away. And if it's not yeah. easy for them, yeah. they complain yeah. about it. And so I, I put it in context of, yeah things that are worth it are not going to be easy to achieve. So, but here's the deal, you don't, mm. you don't quit. You ask questions. I'm going to allow you to make a fool out of yourself and fail, but don't judge it because it's going to come easy for some and not so easy for others. And there will be some, sometimes where I'll point to a kid like, you know, like, you know, you're complaining about that she can turn better than you. Well, guess what? You're jumping higher than her, you know? And you're yeah. also doing yeah. your air tricks or your air skills are better than her. So everybody's going to yeah. always have some kind of strength. Not everybody's going to be good at something. Yeah. You know what I mean? If you can leg up, mm. okay, fine. Then make it the cleanest and longest line you could give me. Dance long. Give them an alternative solution to, to, to be able to help them see their strengths. But for me, it's always a question of like, right. if you're afraid of something, welcome it. Fail. Learn mm -hmm. from it because that's what's going to make you stronger and that's what's going to make you grow. So it's not just a lesson of the step, but the lesson of, of 
a personal uh, growth for them because in the end, really, like, you know, I always say this a lot, it's the person first, dancer second, okay? So we are developing the person first. The dancer is 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 just a reflection of the person that's there. So if if those lessons aren't being taught in the dancer to be a better person of integrity and to work hard, to not quit or whatever, it doesn't really matter how good of a dancer they are. You know what I mean? They may win in competition, mm. but when they go out into real life and there's no longer that that vortex where they're in, where they're competing and winning, how they're going to survive. And yeah. oftentimes, a lot of those kids quit. Hmm. So. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it, it, it's, it, it, yeah, yeah, yes. <laughs> wow. Um, and I, and again, I, I'm saying I, this, I, this is not, I don't have all the answers. This is just my own experience. Yeah. And I'm just, I'm just no, but it makes yeah, so much it, sense. It, it because, makes so much sense. I think, yeah. I think you drive home the point of they got to do this. Okay, then why do you got to do it? But it's also yeah. been a reflection of you as a person. If you quit, like on this, like if you are becoming, if you become a doctor and you're trying to cure cancer, you're going to quit because you're going to have the end. They still haven't found a cure for it, but you don't see any of those doctors quitting. Yeah. You know, we're much further yeah. now yeah. In, in that there's more cures now, but it's taken decades, right? So, as the answer is, it's, it's, it's a reflection of our own fight in life. And the way we present ourselves in life. Yeah. And so, you know, I don't want to try to hyper dramatize that, but it, you know, the dance class and how you function it is a microcosm of how you're going to function in the world. Yeah. 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 I, a, a colleague of mine, uh, his mentor always told him the way you do one thing is yes. the way you do everything. So it's kind of to that similar point of like, if you, if you fail at this thing, then who's to say you're not or, going to just or, continue or to do that no matter what you, you do. Like. Well, guess what? The world yeah. is not going to allow you to yeah. always do the things you like. You know what I mean? You're going to have to do yeah. choreography yeah. with chore a choreography that that might hate you, and you might hate them, but you're but you right. have a choice. You have to stay in the gig because that's your paycheck. You know what I mean? There's, yeah. There's not really <laughs> yeah. anything. There's yeah. not a formula, but I think the most important yeah. part is if you are settled in yourself as a person. You know what I mean? And you're strong, and you understand what's important. It not only helps you survive and, and function in this very difficult art form where there's so much judgment, mm. there's so much self-effacing energy. We always are so critical of ourselves. Yeah. And I always in, encourage the answers to be like, hey, I want you to say something nice to, to her. What do you like about her? Because it's not hearing them. Mm. You know mm. what I mean? Um, and there are classes where I want you to raise your hand if you felt it, you know compelled by their improvisation. And some people will Go to the yeah. and sometimes they'll point at somebody that may not be the best dancer. You have no idea how much it means when a fellow dancer compliments them and they don't even know each other. It empowers them to understand that who yeah. they are matters, that they're taking space and they're yeah. being seen and heard. Mm. So. I'd love to hear your thoughts on how you adapt your teaching, if, if you do at all, to convention versus let's say more of an in, in, oh, in-house workshop for dance works. Is there, are you, are you catering things yes. differently? I think it's, um, it's unfortunately like known that ballet is not necessarily the, the, the favorite <laughs> class at convention. Um, and, and I think that, that sometimes I know I have been present in conventions where the teacher takes that personal. Yeah. And then allows that to be the driver yeah. of the class. How do you I, kind of, how do you navigate that? How do you create a space where the kids are comfortable and you're so comfortable? When I go teach for like Valley West, which is where you know I, I've done a couple of work for them, right? And I go teach right. at the conservatory. The way I teach there is very different than the way I teach at convention. Why? In convention, my whole mission is for you to appreciate the art form, even if you don't like it. I have a lot of hip hop mm. dancers to take my class. Mm. Why? I don't just do a regular normal comedy so it's boring. I make it physical. I make it fun. Whether mm -hmm. I use a piece of music that's different, I make it exciting. I make them, and, I, and I, I preface it. You don't have to be a great ballet dancer to do well in my class. All, I, all you have to be in my mm -hmm. class is be a great student. And what does that mean? Mm -hmm. A great student listens. A great student pays attention. They raise an end to ask questions. Right. They don't take themselves out of the equation if they're disinterested in it, right? So I always preface my class about this is about the learning, not about becoming a ballet dancer. I'm going to, to teach you how to learn in a difficult traditional 400-year-old idiom, 
but we're going to have fun doing it. And I think if, if you preface yes. it and you allow, and, and the expectation for me is I know that not everybody's going to be a great ballet dancer in my class. I know that there are going to be people that probably have never taken ballet or not good at it. I'm okay with that. What I am not okay with mm. is when they choose to not participate mm. or they choose to give up on themselves in the class because mm. they don't know how to do petit legro. And I tell them, try. Yeah. I don't care if you look crazy. Try. Feel it in your body. Just <laughs> feel it in your body. So for me, it's the way I teach it is inclusive. It is engaging. It yeah. is about not quitting on yourself. It is about trying something new. It is mm. about, look, just so long as you're trying, even if you don't know it, like that would be me like taking hip hop class. But when God mm. bless his heart, when, when Twitch was part of our faculty, I would take his hip hop class. I look crazy. Yeah. But you know what? He would take my uh, class. Yes. And he would do Petit Allegro. Yes. So it was kind of a good lesson for the kids to see that it's like, it doesn't matter. You go into it. I'll take some of the other faculty. Mm. I'm 50 years old, but I'll take, I'll take Warren Adams class once in a while. I'll do it. You know, I mean, it's just about the yeah. experience. So, yeah. you know, I think if you go into it that way and then you come up with a combination where you feel is challenging enough, you put it to music that is classical, but exciting. Like, you know, that Max Richter yeah. Vivaldi music, you know, that he just redid recently. And and the music is very, very, they use it a lot in contemporary. I always pick music mm -hmm. that is going to be emotionally engaging. There's Mozart concertos that I use, but if they figure out a way to like, to express themselves, then maybe it's not so bad. So I don't teach it different piano music. Mm. I'll try to get, I understand the audience that I'm, that I'm catering to and I'm teaching to. So I always try to bring in elements that may yes. be exciting to them. But I always preface it, preface it as, it's not about being a great, great ballet dancer in my class, it's about being a great student. That means you have to try, that means you yeah. have to fail. Yeah. My whole mission here and what ends up happening is that they are seen and heard and they wanna participate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's incredible. So it's it's almost, so do you feel like you're almost just, is it managing your expectations yeah. going into the class or is it, a, is it a little bit of checking the ego at the door it's or is it above. all of the above? It's all to the get above. To that I point. know that some classes okay. are better than okay. others. I know that I have to adjust according to what the energy of the class is. If they're really down, then I have to figure out a way to come bump mm. them up. Sometimes I'll say, listen, I know it's not your favorite, but I need for you to try, yeah. you know, trying something new or let's yeah. try it like this, you know? The thing about it, it, you know, I think the difficult thing about uh, our structure for 24-7 for is that we use the ballet classes as an audition for their scholarship. So I think that also helps. Correct, like yeah. they have no choice but to really do it, right? Because there is um, right, an right, outcome right. that is required of them to participate in ballet as part of the audition to get that winner scholarship. Yeah. You know, it's already kind of padded in a way where they have to try no matter what, right? Otherwise they don't get to do it. Yeah. But I think, yeah. I think, also, I've done this for so long that the minis and sidekicks that I taught 10 years ago have graduated or now seniors, and then I keep teaching young ones, and they understand from, yeah. from, from minis. Like, I will say this, and you could ask anybody, but when it's my mini class, that room is quiet. Nobody throws anything. <laughs> I am like a general in there. And, the, and because I'm, and I pointed out, yeah. I said, you're cute and all, but it doesn't work for me. You need to stand still. And I'm not afraid to say it yeah. to the parents because I tell them, this is about discipline, about tradition and respect. If you want to yell at me for yelling, for, mm -hmm. for pointing out your child for not doing those things, I don't think that you're going to win in this argument because who's going to argue about dedication, tradition, yeah. and respect, right? But my mini class is always very right, quiet. Right. It's always very organized because, and, the, and then I always encourage the kids to try and I call out their names. Great job, so and so. Even the girl in the back who doesn't know what they're doing, I call yeah. them out yeah. and encourage them. And then the kids see, oh, she's doing it. I'm, okay, I want to get my name called out. It becomes this thing. And so those minis understand yeah. Yeah. the respect that I demand from them. And so when they get to the older levels, as soon as I walk in the room, there's not even a battle anymore. They know exactly what, what is expected. So there's yeah. a little bit of a build up there. Yeah. The mini the minis are really, really a challenge. The sidekicks, especially the four to seven year olds are a challenge. Like I teach very different when they're still young. You know, I, I make it really funny and silly. Mm -hmm. But as soon as they get into the mini room, it it switches right away. I don't yeah. know, does that make yeah. sense? Amazing. Yeah, that makes sense. And I think just you articulating it the way that you do speaks volumes to just the quality of you as an educator as well. I think it's I think it's really clear no matter how long you've been teaching for, it's always easy to spot people that are genuinely great teachers. And the, the way that you articulate well, it just makes so much sense. And, and, and also, it's very, very listen, clear. I know a lot, but I still don't know much. 
like I am always upper more because right, because right, right, right. But I think that's I think that's clear yeah. in the way you speak. Well, though, yeah, that you're well, still hungry for thing it. Too is like the generations that are coming up, they they are, we didn't have this. We don't have the cell phone. I I can go and take a thirty yeah. minute yeah. So like, this this bus was ride to go to the yeah. library to know who Baryshnikov was. You know now they can <laughs> Google it and they're right there. I mean like. <laughs> You know, can they see think everything, everything yeah. M- yeah. more than they should. But, you know, but the danger there is that they think everything is instant, right? They see a picture on Instagram and they think they can do it. I'm like, right. no, do not try a double back. Right. You know, you're not qualified to do that. Right. Or they think right. that that's, that line is easily when they find out that you can't just look over and get the answer. Just the way, you, like, you know, if you're in school, you, I always say this metaphor. Yeah. You can't just look over and get the answer from Susie and then put it in your paper and you get credit for it. I'm sorry, in dance, you can't look over and be like, all of a sudden, mm. oh, my leg is up. Oh, I can dance like that. I have that musicality. No, you have to do the actual work. That's why dancers are always yeah. so smart. You know, when I went to the Harvard Ballet Company, mm. the choreograph in Harvard, they actually love admitting dancers former dancers, most of them female, because they have a high proclivity of overachievement. They can remember information a lot. Uh, a lot of the, the dancers that are in company, they end up having successful careers in law. And I mean, like, who was it? There was, in my cast alone, yeah. there was a Harvard pre-law person. There was a biomechanics person. There was a person working on an algorithm for the stock market. I was like, these are this is my <laughs> cast. And you have no <laughs> idea how intimidating it was for me yeah. to create on them. Because their language, the way they speak, they're mm. so smart. And then, so, but that, I made that work in our process because they were smart. I was able to push them. I say, okay, do this duet. Now go over to the side and do it backwards. And they were able to do it. Or uh, I'd say, do this duet. Yeah. But instead, do it on the floor, but hit the perspective here. And they were like, okay, sure. They're able to do it because they're so freaking <laughs> smart, right? Like, they, so for me, although yeah, I was intimidated, yeah. I made it work for the process so that the piece that ended up coming together was really quite beautiful and and unexpected. I also learned a lot right. about myself that even no matter how much I, I have under my plate with choreographing for different people, famous or not, when I went to Harvard, mm. I got nervous, you know, because, because mm. it was a group of students that mm. it is the elite of the elite in terms of intelligence, right? And I was like, God, I know nothing yeah. compared to these guys. Like, I don't know much. Like, I don't know... <laughs> The algorithm for a stock market, I mean, like, holy moly, like, mm. you know what I mean? Like, but <laughs> the thing that I noticed too is that they may be smart here, it is necessarily that they're smart here. Mm. Their intelligence in their head mm. doesn't always equate to kinesthetic intelligence in the body. And that's when I realized, wait, right, you might be a right. genius, but in terms of dancing, there's still some things to work on. So that was also humbling for myself to see. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I backing up a little bit, I, I wanted to ask what you're seeing right now. I mean, you, as much as anybody has a very, very close finger on the pulse mm-hmm. of like dance currently, what are you seeing right now? That's maybe a frustration of yours, or maybe it's something that you're just seeing a lot of dancers struggle with. What's something that is just kind of stand out in your head at this moment oh, in time God. within dance? Can we actually get back to actual training and stop noodling and improving all the time? Oh my God. Like seriously, mm-hmm. like now because there's so much contemporary, there's so much contemporary, right? And they're dancing yeah. to this music and you have to count. Well, you put on a jazz piece of music, they can't hit a sharp accent. <laughs> they're off the music or they mm-hmm. don't understand how to move other than, look, there is nothing wrong and I encourage this to find yourself in an improv situation. Finding and being able to move sophisticatedly yeah is going to be amazing. But the majority of our work means that we have to mm-hmm. assimilate into the choreographer's vision. So if you don't have a separate opinion, you know what I mean? And you don't yeah. balance it out. Like I'm saying, do that. Be an incredible improvisationalist, but you have to yeah. also match that with an incredible foundational training to be able to juxtapose those two things. But there are a lot of people that really like to noodle and mm-hmm. do whatever they want. And they want their solos to reflect whoever they are, which is fine because then that wins, I get that. But that limits me from yes. showing a leg or showing a turn or showing a floor work section or understanding how to shift your weight, right? So for me, I I think it's that is is one of the things. The other thing too is that, you know, I go into the concert dance world and a lot of my friends are dancing for Ballet BC and there's these different choreographers like Crystal Pipe and Matt's Eck mm-hmm. and different choreographers, Garrett Smith, you know, he's from Utah, he's incredible. 
like his stuff is just yeah. you know comes comes from Europe. As a country, we are very very immature when it comes to contemporary dance. Canada is way ahead of us. They're twenty years right. ahead. Europe is even further ahead because they have the access and the funds. I mean, Germany gives two percent of their entire annual governmental budget, and they dedicate it to dance and to the arts. I mean, that's hundreds of millions yep. of dollars. We don't have that access here. So, so yeah. I think you know. Um, I think the copying is hard for me to see um, because you know they they take mm. a vision like for instance Crystal Platt I have several friends that dance with the company she takes two years to take an idea and research it she's in a studio putting together the show and it's a voice that she feels is Jeez. is is um, is pertinent to the zeitgeist of what's happening right now and so when somebody a commercial yeah. choreographer inadvertently just takes that idea. It is so incredibly personal. Have you ever been robbed? Okay, so you know when uh, you have, walk into yeah. the place, like my studio was robbed one time. We were out, and then I came back, and everything was ransacked. Mm -hmm. It felt so personal mm -hmm. to me because I felt like my space that I worked so hard for yeah. to build, you know, that's what it feels like to these choreographers. And so, like, it's yeah. hurtful for yeah. them. I mean, I understand if you want to imitate it. Because it's a sincere form of flattery, but to flat out just take the idea and make it your own, and and to and then thinking that it's okay yeah. to do that, it is not okay to do that. There's a difference between referencing and a difference between really plagiarizing. And if you're plagiarizing something and you know it's there, yeah. you know, like that's in your conscience. But on the other end of it, you know, I mean, I think people are, you know, the the choreographers guild and all that stuff is starting to form, but. I mean, there were, there were some issues where, you know, yeah. Mary Killian sued, you know, a commercial choreographer for stealing their stuff. There were legal things that happened. It's not publicized right. easily because, you know, it's not really a big deal. You know, I mean, it's not like Hollywood or whatever. Yeah. But yeah. the rights and the work of somebody who has spent their life and their experience and they spent time creating that for somebody yeah. to just inadvertently take it, it's like, it's like being robbed. It's so personal and it's hurtful to them right, because it's right. like you're taking something so personal. And now, if you want to reference it and you want to take it as an idea and make it your own, great. But to plagiarize that work mm. is something that is really, I mean, I'm talking about it because I've seen, you know, friends of mine who teach and then somebody on Instagram will just take the choreography and put it in competition. And then they found out later that it's been used and it's their voice and more more people yeah. are standing up for it. Yeah. Look, you know, I I don't have time to go to social media to see if anybody's taking my stuff. I have no idea. And if you want to take it, it's <laughs> them. It's on them. But it does bother me that. Yeah. So those two things for me are, yeah. are the biggest thing. Yeah. Because also the other thing too, this there's so much contemporary, right? Like it's so saturated that it's yeah. like, yeah. Where else are we going to go? And right now, where Europe is going, yeah. the U.S. audiences are not ready for it. You know, mm. yeah. Interesting, interesting. Yeah, I, I, I would agree. I'm, I'm definitely more movement oriented myself. But I think the one thing that I try to do and that I see is happens a lot when when studios start pushing improv and movement in general. Exactly. Is there's no structure to it. So, so there's there's no sort of like I think. I like to approach movement from the sense of like, I still want the dancers to get something actionable out of it that can right. carry over to the rest of their dancing as opposed to just allowing them to just kind of freely move with no well, sense of direction or structure. Because in, in reality, that doesn't well, carry well, much over example. to anything else. When I saw a dance teacher summit, I had 80 ballet dancers from over, 80 ballet dancers from over the world come to my class. And I told them, okay, I know this is sound, mm -hmm. but we're going to work on our feet and articulation. And I'm like, okay, they're ready to go. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, we're going to do it for improv. And then half of them went, yes, and cross your legs. Right. So I said, right. let me explain. We're going to go through a series of tasks that are going to be the opposite of what you normally do. But just trust me on this. But they were like, so, you know, we started out with, okay, feel your feet on the floor. Feel how you're shifting your weight from your little toe. Maybe you, maybe mm -hmm. the, the space between your second and third toe you never felt. Feel that space. Feel your heels. Then I want you to write your name. With your foot only i want your hands behind your back mm. write your name anyway it kept going we let it right this task had a yes. specific purpose and that is for them to find articulation right. and movement and and feeling in the legs and feet well they didn't drop for the first 10 the 10 15 minutes and then i said okay let's take that they were moving and shifting their weight and then i said i could go to first position 
And then they went like this with their feet. And then half of them were like, what? I said, yes, <laughs> I know that you disagreed, but how are you feeling? Oh my gosh, I feel my feet. I feel my toes. I feel the connection between my inner thighs. But wait, you improv before this. We didn't do Tommy. Yeah. I said, sometimes the answer isn't always the obvious. Sometimes you have to go the opposite to get what mm. is needed. And I've had a lot of people mm. tell me that that was life changing for them. And also, because it makes you, yeah. you know, when you're, when you're not, when you're giving the freedom to feel your own body and there's no judgment, you go for it, right? And then when you then put that freedom and then you put in yeah. something structured, the detail of how you feel that is crazy. So like that is an example of how improv works functionally. I'll do yes. it and say, we're yeah. improving because we need to feel our spine. Okay. Or I say, we're improving because we need to understand how to shift our weight. Yes. You're going to yes. improv with somebody. We're going to do it without touch. Mm-hmm. You're going to understand how to shift your weight. You're going to understand how, if you do a shape and relate, you do shape and you relate. How do you, if your weight's there, how do you move without letting that person fall? So there's always a specific mm. task involved. If it's musicality. Yeah. I say yeah. to them, okay, we're going to improv to something really um, like, like an ambient um, piece of music. Now I'm going to put on Florence the Machine and we're going to match yes. the inflection of her voice. And you're going to go crazy when she goes crazy. You're not. So yeah. there's always a structure and a task. I think putting on the music and improv and do whatever you want doesn't do anything. Because the kids are always going to improv and yeah. do a yeah. leg, yeah. a headband, a bridge. They're yep. only going to yep. improv yep. what yep. they already know how to do. So if you're going to, yeah, if you're yeah, going to push their vocabulary your capacity, there has to be a task and structured way of doing it where it's feasible for them to understand. Yeah. And, and we as teachers yeah. need to guide it. Otherwise it's just like, do whatever you yeah. want. And I'm yeah. like, okay, well, you're not growing. You're not going to find out anything new. So then why do we improv? You know what I mean? And I think there's that. Yeah. Construction. Yeah. 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 And, yeah. Well, and I was going to say, I come from like a street style background, specifically popping. And one thing that we do in, in a lot of the street styles do this, but in popping, it's really big. It's called labbing. And it's, it's exactly what you're describing where we take a very, very niche movement or technique. And we'll just focus on that for like, I mean, people will do this for 30 minutes, an hour, two hours. And it's all in the effort of like expanding your yeah. understanding of that specific movement. So then when you apply it to the macro, well, you well, have, you have it dialed in already. Is that, like, people don't um, understand the improvisational stuff that's big right now that everybody's doing, that every contemporary teacher is doing actually comes from the ballet world. Okay. Let me explain. There's a guy, his name is William Forsyth. Mm. He choreographed, um, you know, in the middle of some of the elevated, yes. but he was really, really instrumental in taking Bartania fundamentals and the spatial stuff and really developing these improvisational technologies to help deconstruct ballet dancers. So what he did was he was so frustrated right. working with dancers that were so beautifully trained that he was like, I got to find a way for these guys to move again differently. And right now there's no way for them to be able to do mm. it. So he deconstructed that and came up with these tasks that help them not do this arm, but do this arm, or instead of doing this, how can we make it? So he, yeah. you know, he came up with this stuff. And so, so much of the stuff that you see, these contemporary dancers that are commercially teaching right now, they're actually taking it and not even realizing it's yeah. come from ballet. It's the deconstruction of ballet that started this whole movement. Mm. Contact improv in the modern world is different. There's always been improvisation in terms of exploration, and it's more theatrical. But the stuff that you see right now, in my opinion, yeah. and I'm not saying that my opinion is the opinion, I'm just, but from what I see of where it comes from, it definitely comes from the ballet world. The whole thing about feeling your elbow mm-hmm. and all that. And then also, Ohad Mahadin developing that gag, the Gaga technique, right? And his, his is all about just feeling where your spine is and sitting into it, the breadth of it, the circularity of it, and really hyper, like, like hyper um, micro isolating every single thing in your body and feeling what that is they could you know that's another yeah. way of doing yeah. it so it also comes from that so those are the two main influences that i feel like really define the improv uh the improvisational diaspora mm. and it in, in now infiltrated in the commercial world yeah. and i get that but i think the majority of them don't understand that although i do have to say that there are more co- kids that are not going back to studios that are teaching that are not that now have degrees from juilliard and all these places so they're taking that knowledge down near changing right. the conversation because of that so. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Um, yeah. I, as we head into this last little five or so minutes, I would love to, I, I kind of always like to ask, what's the thing that's on your mind right now that if, if 
if anybody takes anything away from this episode, who's listening or watching, what would be the one thing that you would kind of drive home to them that your your feeling is oh, gosh. is prevalent oh, right man. now? Um, there's so much. But there's <laughs> one, because of social media, I, I need for dancers to really be careful of imposter syndrome. Okay, they think that they, what they mm. see in social media is who they should be. No. <laughs> that is not where you should be. Just because so-and-so has 5.5 million followers doesn't mean that by doing what they're doing, that you're going to do gonna have the same. No, they got those followers because they are who they are. You have to find your voice and you have to fit mm. in. You don't have to try to fit in. Just be who you are and, and let the world um, see your uniqueness and see your gifts. But oftentimes in this generation, especially the young ones, they have to have you know the right outfit they have to have the right sponsorship. They have to have a collaboration. It's become this thing where they, they, they're only seen in social media. I'm sorry to say this, but in real life, when you're not on your phone, you have to know how to be seen and to take space and to stand and hold your ground and also understand who you are. I asked them, they're just, mm. who are you? What do you like? What? What? They go like this. I'm like, and then they go to their phone. <laughs> and then they, they I like this. I said, don't tell me with your phone what you like and what images do you like? Or, or you know what, do tell me actually, because if that is a way for me to unlock and make you understand who you are, then let's do it through that thorough way. We use it in a way to unlock mm. certain possibilities mm. in themselves. So for me, it's just, you are who you are. You're born in this world with certain gifts. Find out what those gifts are for you. Find out what makes you unique and speak it loudly. Work on speaking it loudly. Do not try to assimilate and fit into what you think is going to make you popular or make you big because that is a recipe for disaster because if you don't understand who you are, you know what I mean, and you cater to the social media, which is fine because, you know, com commercially they might work, but then when you're out of it and you're a real person, who are you? And the majority of people nowadays want to yeah. understand who you are to combat this thing that everybody thinks they need to be. They need to be this, they need to have this, they need to have this many followers. I understand in the in the commercial world that you have to have that to get an agency audition. But once you do that and you get there, they're right. gonna want to know who you are and what you're good at. And oftentimes, you know, we end up trying to figure out, you know, who we need to be to get the job. Okay? Play the game, you know, dress the part, but in the end it's your voice that has to be the thing that speaks loudly because we're attracted to human beings first and not be, be whatever has been configured mm. to fit this particular role to get the job. In the end, we're attracted to the human being. Mm. Most choreographers that are assistants that I gravitate towards are not the dancers that are winning, are the ones that I feel I have a connection to with as a person. Similar insecurities, similar viewpoints mm. about the art form, and I hide them. Because I want, I want them. I, I feel comfortable yeah. being myself around them. And so, if I just hire somebody who's already amazing and yeah. and that's all they know how to do, yeah, I could do everything. But I have no, then I have no personal relationship with you. So then, why would I want to keep? Uh, why would I want to collaborate with you or have you be my assistant? There has to be a personal connection, and that can only happen if that dancer understands who they are. That means standing your ground. And if you don't know who you are, mm -hmm. then start figuring out what that is for you without using external influence to inf influence to inform yeah. that. Mm. That's that. That is, you know? uh, yeah, and yeah, look, yeah, look, yeah. I Jason, think, uh, like, uh, yes, 100%. The stuff that you say about corrections in your own podcast, OMG, you get to the root of it. That's who you are. You know what I mean? And so sometimes people are bothered by it. I get it. Some people are probably get pretty upset. But you're saying it how it is. And that's why I agreed to come to your podcast yeah. because you are making a huge difference in, in social media with the conversation. You're actually calling things out. Whether mm. whether you're aware of it or not, you're making a difference. So I and, and sometimes it, <laughs> it upsets people. Thank but you, you thank can't you. shake the establishment without yeah. upsetting them. And if it's making people second guess, you know, yeah. just assimilating. Yeah and they're actually thinking about things and they're actually questioning, you're helping them figure out where they are in this whole process. And so your work is significant in this by bringing these different books together, you know, and I want to say that, you, you know, you know, it, 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 sometimes you'll say things and I'm like, he just hit the nail on the head. Like, <laughs> it's like, 
there's no two ways about it. And and the advice that you say is really, really, really um, right on. It's spot on. So just keep doing what you're doing. Keep building your audience. Thank I'm, you. I'm, Thank you. Uh, humbled that you asked me to be part of this. And I hope that what I said was not like over your head or whatever. It's just I, the, the perspective. Of, you know. No. No, it's, I, it's so true. Just ev- everything you're speaking to is just... Um, yeah, it's. I, I want to take your class. I want to like. I. I. It, it is. I. It, that's what I'm coming out of this like well, so of, excited well, for the next I time I have the opportunity not, to take your class well, because it's just because I'm actually going to be choreographing for a company in Ohio, like a, a world premiere for them. So I was going to say come mm. to Provo 24 seven, but I'm not going to be there this year. <laughs> Otherwise, I'd be like. I'd be uh, like well, well, I'll, no, I'll travel. Like, I'll find something that works. But I mean, yeah. honestly, it's just been, uh, you know, a, a pleasure. And, and the questions that you asked, uh, wow, really made me look and think about like where I'm at currently. So thank you, thank you. Made me reflect. Right, right mm. now, you know, we have our yeah. professional dancer institute coming up here this weekend. It starts tomorrow, and you know, it's. I'm like, now I'm thinking, oh, okay. Thanks for reminding me about all this stuff. <laughs> Of course, of course. And and on that note, just as a very, uh, it kind of as a goodbye, what, where can people find you? Uh, where can people find what you're doing? Yeah, How can so, people see um, when you're I teaching? I used to be better at, at sharing my schedule, but it's so weird. So like, just look out for it on Instagram. Francisco Gala Dance is my, is my tag. Or you can go to franciscogaladance.com. That is mm-hmm. the, that is the website with all of my engagements for teaching and my intensives. There's also... Uh, Zeitgeist Dance Theater. I know it's a German word for Son of the Times. Um, that is the professional company that we're developing here in Santa Fe. It's another place to do it. Um, I also just say, like, if, we, if, if all that's too much, I know this sounds kind of pompous, but just Google my name and all of it will pop up. <laughs> Francisco Gala, it'll all pop up. Yes, it you. will. It but, will. You know, like, where it is, you know, like, we, we've been very strategic about making sure. Yeah. People know, and if you have any questions about anything, you can always either send an email at info at franciscogaladance.com or you can just DM me on Instagram or Facebook and we will get back to you, you know, with Amazing. That. Amazing. Of course. Amazing. Francisco, thank you so, so much for, for your time today. I really, really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, just, just thank you for, and thank you for being an amazing educator and inspiring people like me to continue and and, and you reach found, you new heights. So voice. thank you so much. Keep running with it, man. You're doing some great work. Proud of you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much.